Okay, so I want to shift into the Emergency War Powers Act of 1933 and how that has set you up in the current situation. And also, I want to give some direction of how you can get out of this mess. Um, and that will culminate in the three simple steps that you can do right now. So let me call your attention to an excellent lecture from 1994 by Eugene Schroeder about emergency war powers. And um, this is something that you definitely want to spend your time listening to and doing some additional research. Uh, don't do it all in one sitting unless you're that obsessive type, uh, because it can be very intriguing. But I want to go over the important points to generate the context of what the predicament that we're in is so that we can talk about the steps you can take to get out of this predicament, which essentially amounts to being a slave. In 1933, we had the Great Depression. And the Great Depression, according to many financial analysts, actually could have been easily subverted because what happened was is that there was a contraction or a decrease in the money supply. And at that time, we did have the Federal Reserve, but all the Federal Reserve notes were backed by gold, and there was apparently sufficient gold that more currency could have been released into circulation. And that did not happen, unfortunately, so it really crushed the economy. And there seemed to be no way out, although the Federal Reserve at any time could have acted by increasing the currency supply. And uh, it's pretty telling that they didn't, but it did lead to this key change, uh, which I am about to uh, divulge. But just to kind of explain how not having enough currency can be so devastating to the economy and the situation is imagine that if you are a business or an individual and you want to, you need resources uh, in order to get it done. So you're a business, you need to buy raw, more raw materials. You want to expand your business. You need to repair uh, equipment. You need to hire more workers. Well, those things, many of them are contingent upon taking out, being able to take out loans um, and use funds to pay for those things. But there simply weren't enough funds to make loans and currency available for those businesses to operate. And the same thing would be true for individuals, uh, no currency to pay rent or buy uh, homes or other items. So because of that shortage, um, everyone went without. So along came FDR because they, you know, Federal Reserve tried to get Hoover to enact some of these measures, but he refused. But once FDR was elected, and perhaps there was even some secret arrangement uh, between the Federal Reserve and other bankers and FDR that uh, they would help him get elected if he would sign off on these emergency war powers. So in 1933, um, FDR, uh, almost uh, within a couple of days after his inauguration, uh, essentially signed the emergency uh, war powers legislation, which included several different acts, um, the Emergency Banking Act being one of the principal ones, but also the Farm Act and, and uh, several others. And um, these acts essentially referred back to the Trading with the Enemies Act. And this was a law that was passed during World War I when they realized that there may be um, citizens or nationals of the countries that the United States was at war with in the continental United States. So, for example, there may be Germans um, in the United States who may be enemies. So they enacted a restriction on all financial transactions for these potential enemies of the state. And there was a specific exception for transactions that were conducted wholly within the United States, uh, meaning that United States citizens were exempt from the Trading with the Enemies Act. But in 1933, FDR essentially applied the Trading with the Enemies Act to United States citizens. And this amounted to a conferral of authoritarian control, initially for all transactions of any kind, over enemies of the state, including United States citizens. So we have been labeled or considered as belligerents and enemies 
of the state. And this is essentially an act of war against the American people, according to Schroeder. So what are the consequences of these emergency acts and how has it changed uh, life for our experience? And all of us uh, essentially here have been alive our entire existence under a state of emergency with these provisions. So what was established? Well, it was established that all transactions, including domestic transactions, are now completely regulated uh, by the government and require approval in a number of ways. And it was expanded beyond just transactions to all forms of intercourse. So anytime anyone interacted with anyone else in any way. So this is where licenses were created for certain types of transactions. So for example, to provide health services, that's a transaction, right? You provide health services in exchange for some consideration, like usually money or currency. Now a license is required for that type of transaction as with all other transactions. Whereas before there were no licenses required. It was just an agreement between two men or women. What else was prohibited? Owning of gold and silver. Um, in fact, also uh, gold and silver was essentially confiscated. And although in name, uh, the currency was still said to be backed by gold for a period of time, there really was no gold backing it. The standing of you and I in court was taken away. We have no right now to remedy for breach of contract or other uh, grievances in a courtroom. Courts are run according to a military tribunal adjudicating enemies of the state. It has become illegal to own property. All property is owned by the state. We are merely the users of the property. And this is a very similar content to you'll rent everything and own nothing, except it already re exists like this. For example, property tax. If you have a right to own property, you're not allowed to tax a right. So you would not be able to have property tax if you own the property. So property tax tells us that we don't own the property. That is essentially our rent for use of the property. Also, the minerals and other resources of the land belong to the government and can be seized uh, by the government in a state of emergency. Also, all property, including gold, can be seized. And this seizure of all of the gold that was contained in the treasury um, is what allowed creating the emergency war currency. And the emergency war currency is what we are using today as enemy of the state, enemies of the state and belligerents. And these are referred to in the Emergency Banking Act of 1933 as Federal Reserve banknotes. Okay, and they are based upon the assets of the bank rather than real money like gold, silver, or other tangible assets like real estate. But instead, the assets of the bank amounts to your tender. So in other words, your promise to pay. When you take out a loan or apply for credit of any kind, you are making a promise to pay. And that is the asset of the bank that allows them to get Federal Reserve notes. Okay, I'm going to go over this a little bit more, but this comes from Title IV of the Emergency Banking Act. And what it says is, in quotes, that banks are entitled to receive, right, not borrow, but receive from the comptroller of the currency circulating notes in blank, in other words, currency, and in exchange for notes, draft, bills of exchange, and bankers' acceptances. Okay, so those are all different forms of negotiable instruments that are essentially promises to pay. So for issuing the promise to pay, which comes from us originally, the banks receive the currency. Now, if we go, there's one part of the law I want to read here, and this is how this is codified in the modern law. And it's in the Federal Reserve Act, Section 16. And I just want to point out a couple of things. Now, this is how currency, those dollars that you carry around in your wallet, how they are actually created and come into existence and what they are. Now, they are not money because they are not backed by real money like gold or silver. Okay, they, they are what we could call just banknotes, Federal Reserve banknotes or tender, legal tender which is a promise to pay from us. <laughs> it's our promise to pay. 
Okay, so here is what it says from the Federal Reserve Act. And this is under the heading one, issuance of Federal Reserve notes. So it says Federal Reserve notes, which are the dollars, to be issued at the discretion of the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System for the purpose of making advances to Federal Reserve banks, right, which are the banks we take loans from, through the Federal Reserve agents as here and after set forth and for no other purpose are hereby authorized. The said notes shall be obligations of the United States and shall be receivable by all national and member banks. Okay, so the national and member banks are the ones we get our loans from. And the all it says the said notes shall be obligations of the United States. So that's very important. So, in other words, obligation means debt, right? It has to be paid back by the United States. And it says the United States, not the United States of America. The United States is a corporation which is the parent corporation of all of our straw man corporations. So in other words, these Federal Reserve notes are an obligation of our straw man corporation. And that's really the source of the value and where it comes from. It doesn't come from gold or other money, right? It comes from our promise, from our trust account, from our obligation as straw man citizens of the United States. So that's key. So that means when we take out a loan, we're actually getting the money from ourselves. It's just passing through several hands. And this is how it passes through the hands. And this is part two of section 16, titled Application for Notes by Federal Reserve Banks. Any Federal Reserve Bank may make application to the local Federal Reserve agent for such amount of the Federal Reserve notes here and before provided for as it may require. Such application shall be accompanied with a tender, a tender is a promise to pay, to the local Federal Reserve agent of collateral in the amount equal to the sum of the Federal Reserve notes thus applied for. Okay, so in other words, there has to be a promise to pay back the same amount as the number of dollars that are requested. And it said the collateral security thus offered shall be notes, drafts, bills of exchange, or acceptances. Okay, now that's the same language that I read from Title IV of the Emergency Banking Powers Act of 1933, and that's what we observe today. So the bank gets from you a promissory note, which is your promise to pay a loan. They submit that to their Federal Reserve agent. Then the Federal Reserve Bank takes those funds, creates a obligation to the United States, ultimately to your straw man, and then transfers those funds into the bank, the member bank that you take the loan from, and then they transfer it to you for your benefit. So essentially, they're really just transferring your own funds so that you can use them. But through that promissory note, they trick you into paying it back a second time, even though it was your funds to begin with.